Hello and welcome to a brand new show of Market Makers. My guest on the show today is someone who has championed the art of long-term investing, Bharat Shah of uh, yeah, ASK Investment Managers. Bharat, what a delight to have you back on Itina. Thank, Thank you for joining us. Before we get into specifics and talk about uh, the art of uh, long-term investing, first let's talk about markets. When we started the year, we were trading at the top of the heap. Then we corrected. Now we have bounced back. So at the beginning of the year, everyone was bullish then everyone was bearish, and right now everyone is confused. Well, I think we have made it a habit to keep predicting market for every short period and otherwise. And I think rather than trying to predict the twists and turns of the market, it is more essential to focus on businesses, opportunities, and evaluate those opportunities in sync with one's uh, uh, filtering process. If we remain true to that, then trying to get into the game of predicting the market and trying to so-called time the market uh, would become an uh, uh, avoidable luxury that we somehow indulge in. And I think it is an avoidable luxury because trying to time the market is akin to making uh, uh, predictions which empirically have not been validated as a consistently predictable art or even a science. And to that extent, I would uh, prefer to focus on businesses trying to figure out their value and trying to see that uh, we are able to participate with discipline at a fair gap to their value and remain with them. The trick is to identify at the early stage with a clarity that what will create value and whether those essential traits are there or not. Uh, having done that work and having identified it, then we have to remain with a commitment so long as the price value equation is reasonable and uh, continues to create uh, favorable returns. That is the key to, mm. uh, to my mind uh, in terms of uh, investing and not really trying to predict every month or a quarter or a year, which somehow, but unfortunately, has become a fashion in the markets all over the world. Mm. But what ultimately drives uh, economic growth or earnings is the environment. How would you judge the current environment? Commodity prices have corrected, Rate, uh, rates have come down, no transmission is happening. Uh, one would argue that the economic conditions are currently not all that favorable. Uh, clearly, there are challenges. Uh, it's not an easy situation, but it is solvable. Uh, uh, that is the fortunate part of it. Uh, solving that will require concerted efforts and uh, on a continuous basis, but it is solvable. Uh, in terms of the challenges, obviously given the uh, persistent uh, high current account deficit as well as uh, uh, high fiscal deficit, there is a challenge of inflation which has become a bit of stubborn. Uh, even the recent evidence is of a moderating out of inflation, but the, there is a core part of inflation which is still remaining stubborn and which needs to be tamed. Only once that is tamed, I think there will be a greater space in terms of reduction uh, in the interest rate and in, in turn uh, in improving the value of the assets because interest rate is uh, uh, denominated in the value of an asset. So to that extent, falling interest rate will improve the value of asset plus it will improve the shape of profit and loss account and balance sheet of the firms. But uh, that fundamentally will require those macro adjustments to come by. I think uh, recent uh, events suggest that we are on that path now uh, to bring about that improvement in a consistent manner, but it's still not easy and we have to make concerted efforts. But I remain optimistic uh, in terms of the uh, overall opportunity. Uh, if you look at eventually valuations are reasonable, they are at a level which are more or less closer to the lower end of the uh, kind of uh, long-term sustainable uh, average at which markets have typically traded in this country. Uh, given the fact that return on capital employed of the market in general is about 21 odd percent, uh, given also the fact that earnings growth rate still on a more medium to long-term basis, uh, one can reasonably expect to be between 15 to 20 percent for the corporate India. 
and given the fact that the balance sheets uh, barring some of the businesses are in a good shape without undue leveraging and the banking and finance system is rock solid all of that uh, i would suggest uh, gives uh, hopes and confidence uh, and the entrepreneurial capability of india that uh, there are plenty of opportunities uh, it's not as if the whole market of 6500 stocks is an opportunity uh, if one zooms down based on the quality of management quality of the business uh, size of opportunity and the uh, probable earnings growth over a period of time then you can easily filter down 6500 stocks to maybe about uh, 150 200 names and then you optimize in that space left in terms of uh, growth and the quality uh, growth and the uh, uh, price value gap so the combination of earnings growth and the value then can be focused in out of that basket which has passed the taste of quality of business quality of management and the size of opportunity so for someone who is watching the show and wants to really benefit from your wisdom your advice is stick to quality businesses stick to companies which have a strong return on equity and good and businesses which are rather easy to understand absolutely i mean uh, uh, if you buy a high quality business which is simple to understand and with a great return on capital employed which is consistent it is backed by a management whose wisdom sagacity intellect and ethics you trust that such a business is a large addressable opportunity so that it will have a sustainable long term predictable earnings growth that earnings growth need not be some 30 and 35 and 40% even a reasonable uh, uh, 15% to 20% kind of a sustainable earnings growth rate is good enough to create uh, that foundation and to give a superb, superb uh, long-term value. And finally, you uh, you buy that package. It is optimal a discount to uh, its fundamental worth as you can. And then stick to it rather than trying to judge it at every single quarterly result or every single piece of news that you keep hearing. Uh, including from television. Let's talk about your study. You've just commissioned a very strong study on what are the true virtues of long-term investing. What is your th study throwing up? Well, I think uh, uh, some, of the, some of the aspects uh, I already mentioned, uh, that the pivots for value creation are simple. It is we who try to make it complicated. The pivots are... Uh, Let's break it step by step. Uh, the pivots fundamentally are five. One is a large size of opportunity. That is the foundation for value creation, which is akin to saying that you are looking at a large size of fish uh, whether, or you are looking at a large size of a pond. To my mind, markets are usually more engaged in trying to judge the size of fish rather than the size of the pond. And it is most important to judge first the size of the pond. Opportunity has to be large. Thereafter, if the fish has the due characteristics, uh, capability, endurance, it will grow to be large. Uh, if it is large, it will get larger. And if it is not so large, it still will get large with a favorable pond size and favorable uh, conditions and capability. So size of opportunity is a very, very fundamental attribute of a good long-term uh, investing because size of opportunity gives you compounding power. Okay, before yeah. we move to the second point, uh, give me an example of where size of opportunity is very large to your mind. Then we'll um, move to point two. You look at uh, most of the consumer businesses, okay. the size of opportunity is giant. I mean, this is a country of a billion point two uh, people uh, with a rising income, with a rising purchasing power. Uh, hopefully, it will continue to do so for several decades ahead. Uh, many of the consumption needs are still unmet, even of a relatively preliminary nature of consumption. So there's a huge, huge period of growth. We may try to conjecture every quarter and every half year sometimes, but it is really not essential because the long-term opportunity is so outstanding that it is important to remain glued to that. So that is a huge size of opportunity. Okay. And if you have picked out the good uh, uh, areas within that, because there is large variety of consumption, uh, you have plenty to, uh, plenty to ride on. Mm. Similarly, pharmaceuticals, uh, it is a huge 
long term opportunity in the global markets it is a fantastic opportunity in our domestic market for the similar reasons that i articulated for consumer businesses uh, growing healthcare concern uh, growing income recognition of the fact that healthcare is an important aspect of life and all of that spills a large opportunity in domestic market as well as international market where the innovative multinationals are fatigued with their overbearing research budgets and their ability to manufacture has been squashed so indians have a tremendous opportunity in that area huge huge opportunity fundamentally a sound business and uh, any good business can hope to grow at a meaningful uh, 15 to 20% if not higher for a very very long period of time what are the other pivots because you are making a case that it is important to focus on return on equity but along with return on equity growth also has to be strong absolutely which is what my book is talking about that uh, basically return on capital employed provides the sale to ship it provides a backbone because without return on capital employed you cannot create value in other words if the two essential pivots are the uh, healthy return on capital employed or in other words a high quality of business and a decent sustainable predictable long term earnings growth if you have very high earnings growth rate but a very poor capital efficiency or a poor return on capital employed that is a recipe for decimation if you have a very unhealthy return on capital employed as well as a poor growth obviously uh, uh, that scenario is not even worth talking about with that about. logic commodities will never create wealth well commodities uh, will not give you a compounding opportunity that is for sure and that uh, that comes out very clearly unless a commodity business is into a space which is uh, with a set of fortuitous circumstances where uh, the relative price volatility is uh, decimated where they are price maker rather than price taker and uh, and uh, basically they have their destiny under control for example cement is one industry where despite it being in a commodity space it is insulated from imports and to that extent it has a much much better opportunity uh, uh, the business fundamentally is such where uh, all the good players have cost under control and they've got a good pricing power given the demand supply dynamics and uh, all the quality players enjoy exceptional balance sheet with zero debt and they enjoy very healthy return on capital employed which means if the as i mentioned return on capital employed provides a sale to ship the growth in earnings will provide it um, uh, is x like a wind and it will provide it a direction so you need return on capital employed to provide a backbone for value creation and coupled with that a growth in earnings will actually provide it a direction and a momentum so what and has the two together will create a healthy value so what has worked in the past do you think it will work in the future as well because you're making it sound very simple it is simple uh, and uh, like buffett has said investing is simple but it is not easy it is indeed simple the pr basic principles uh, we may want to uh, attribute to us some uh, profound knowledge and all of that as investors because that will do a lot of boosting to our ego but investing is simple there is nothing so difficult uh, that we need some a special genius or special uh, very high level of intellect to be able to do a good job there what we need is a reasonable intellect but more than just the intellect bigger role is that of wisdom and discipline i think wisdom and discipline probably has even a little bit higher role to play uh, in long term value creation out of a good investing than just the pure intellect so you need a combination of reasonable intellect with an exceptional or healthy wisdom and uh, discipline that is a fantastic combination so principle is simple principles have been simple for 300 years of investing application is, is tough it is the application and staying the course resisting the market temptations both of a positive or a negative variety not falling prey to the greed and fear or the hubris not getting tempted to evaluate quote unquote every piece of news that you hear uh, whether it is some sound bites about greece or america or europe or some uh, worry about uh, uh, some macro number here and there and constantly trying 
going to judge this is a this is what destroys a, a good compounding so just so buy we, a good stock buy a good quality business stick to it that will create wealth stick to it and buy them at a reasonable price uh, you don't have to buy it at an exceptional bargain to create value even if you buy them at a reasonable price and even with a reasonable earnings growth rate the outcomes are fantastic you don't have to drive a car at a very fast pace to reach destination either early or well you just have to drive it well in order to reach probably both early as well as in any case uh, in a good condition between the tortoise and the rabbit eventually it's the tortoise which wins uh, well <laughs> i'm i'm not trying to make a parallel of that i'm not saying that you have to be slow but i am merely saying that if you have a steady reasonable growth in earnings let's say even a 15% steady long term compounding of earnings growth coupled with a high quality in other words a high return on capital employed when and addressing a large opportunity such a business will create a fantastic value you can see in the uh, is the uh, is the book examines there are so many businesses which are simple straightforward in consumer space in pharma space in many other businesses where uh, these businesses have compounded and compounded relentlessly irrespective of variety of events that have happened over a period of time it a decent 15 to 20% but have produced an extraordinary market returns of 20 to 25 in some cases even 30 and in some cases even higher than 30% compounded per annum you look at some of the uh, outstanding finance firms which have created a uh, company like uh, grew finance for example is compounded investment returns at an incredible pace of about 40% plus over a 10 year period these Can are the investment in future returns. as well that is a question mark well that which company will still continue to do in the future is something that you have to use the principles find out which companies still befit the description and will continue to do so but the principles remain sacrosanct principles are durable so the uh, the book talks about the principles that these are the principles which create value and if you remain true to them and identify businesses which befit these principles and will continue to honor them uh, are the businesses which will create value so principles first step is to uh, identify and isolate and internalize those principles second step is to use those principles and apply oneself to find out which companies which will match with this description and then third and very important step is to buy them at a reasonable price and stay them the course rather than disturbing them time and again so there are plenty of businesses in variety of areas where healthy combination of simple combination of good return on capital employed long term earnings growth good return on equity good management and uh, uh, staying the course has produce extraordinary compounding of 25% plus uh, per annum uh, for years and years and decades uh, there are plenty of businesses mm. of this kind which uh, very clearly it brings about I have access to your book, but some of our viewers may not have access to your book. What they are, what they would be curious to understand from you is that which are three companies which have constantly featured as wealth creators. This is not a recommendation which I am seeking for you. What I am trying to understand from you is that which are three companies which have a very strong and a robust business model. Well, you are putting me in a little yeah. bit of awkward situation because I prefer not to talk about any individual business uh, in a public media. I am talking about your study. uh well if you look at in the consumer space there are plenty of names which are getting thrown about which have created a fantastic value you look at a name like asian paints you uh, which is not exactly consumer uh, direct consumption item in indirect consumption item or a very very successful business fantastic value creation a company like itc a company like nestle Uh, a company like Smithline Consumer, uh, now Glexo Healthcare, uh, uh, sorry Glexo Consumer Care. Uh, then there is a Marico. Then there is a Pedialyte. There are plenty of sound, solid, good compounding businesses. If uh, 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 a company like Dabur, I mean uh, they have grown not at some 
extraordinary earnings growth rate. Typically, most of these companies have done between 15 to 25, more often than not, between 15 to 20 percent earnings growth. But the returns that they have created over a period of time are indeed extraordinary. You look at in the, con uh, in the consumer space, but a little bit more durable, a firm like TTK Prestige has created, again, an outstanding uh, kind of a compounding, uh, uh, again, based on the same idea. Very healthy return on capital employed, very little need for incremental capital, so very little dilution of capital at any point of time. A decent, rather than more than decent earnings growth rate, typically upwards of 25% over uh, 10 years and higher. And uh, uh, management which has been very sound and well regarded, it is a recipe for extraordinary value creation. In pharmaceutical, if you look at Firms like Sun Pharma, firms like uh, DBs, uh, firms Lupin. like Lupin have done extraordinarily well. Again, the same combination, uh, balance sheet which is not diluted, business which has grown, addressing a large opportunity, very healthy return on capital employed, sound business models, sound management, and fantastic value creation. You look at in finance space, uh, whether you look at HDFC, HDFC Bank, you look at Groove Finance, uh, 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 a firm like um, uh, uh, in recent uh, cases, uh, relatedly, if you see even the firms like Axis Bank and yeah. Yash Bank, many of the, or Shiram Transport, many businesses have created uh, extraordinary value. And they have one thing in common, which yeah. is that they have the good quality business where, ro where growth and return on equity is In strong. automobile. You look at uh, uh, firms like Bajaj Joto, mm -hmm. firms like uh, Hero Motor, uh, even auto ancillary, a firm like Michael Bosch. I mean, there are plenty Thank of you. businesses in each area. Uh, I mean, Stick they're the simple, principles, that's a uh, and you remain with discipline. But just a last follow-up question, and, and, and then we'll wrap uh, after that. What about uh, timing the market? I think it's a popular pastime, but highly destructive for good investing outcomes and for good investment results. Timing, uh, I don't think, is essential. And it is not even a proven either science or art. So I would, I would say more important is uh, sticking to the principles and having the time on your side. And um, um, there is a very interesting uh, aspect which has been analyzed in the book about that. Uh, where what we have done is, um, uh, um, there is a rolling fire cycle over the last 12 years. So say for example, 2001 to 2005, 2002 to 2006, etc., etc. So there are uh, seven or eight fire rolling cycles. Then I am put, so you are not taking any particular cycle bias, whether it is positive or down or upbeat or otherwise, all kinds of cycles are covered over the last 12 years. Then I am saying that, okay, in any cycle, only two conditions, that you buy in the first year of the five-year cycle and you sell in the last year of the five-year cycle. So any point of the first year you buy and any point of the last or the fifth year you sell, which means you buy in the first and sell in the fifth year and remain in between. And then I put a very tough condition in uh, one of the tables there, uh, which is saying that buy at the highest price of the first year, which means I am buying at the most unfavorable price. Then I am selling at the most unfavorable price in the last year, which is at the highest price of the uh, uh, lowest, lowest price, price of the fifth year. Now with that condition, normally you would expect results not to be very good because if you are buying at the highest, selling at the lowest and holding in between for those uh, on that five year duration, normally results shouldn't be very healthy. But it is highlighting that there are champions which have not posted a single period of a negative return in any five-year cycle out of the eight five-year cycles, even with this tough condition. Not only that, there are champions with this kind of a tough condition, they produce a compounded returns minimum of double digit with this kind of condition. Really appreciate your time. Lovely study. Thank you. And glad you could join us today. Yes, sir. That's it on this edition of Market Makers. I'm Nikunj Dalmia signing off. Thank you for watching the show.